wish it was in person. So hopefully that is allowed at some point again soon. Um, but so let me just um, get some slides up here. Um, so what I, what I thought I could do is, um, I mean, I, most of my work right now is in the space of kind of digital policy broadly defined or digital governance broadly defined. And it can be really hard to track uh, what is going on in various jurisdictions around the world in the entire space of digital governance right now. And so I thought I could just do a bit of mapping of what in our various work at our center we've been seeing happen in different countries. Um, maybe apply a lens of platform governance to those different policy initiatives. Um, I find it to be a helpful guide to understand these different initiatives. Um, so I'm going to put that proposition to you that, that it is, and then sort of talk a little bit about where what that tells us about this broad digital governance agenda. Um, just to give you a sense of what we do, though, at the center, so we're... A, a, a wide range of projects that all touch on di digital policy in different ways. Um, in the platform governance space, we're involved with a, a research network of um, several hundred academics around the world who all kind of have opted in to working in a space defined by platform governance. We help coordinate a, a group of civil servants around the world who are implementing policies that they define as platform governance. Um, we developed a network of um, of kind of global practitioners and activists and, and academics working in this space. Um, I coach domestically, I co-chair uh, the Canadian Commission on Democratic Expression um, with Beverly McLaughlin, and we're looking at kind of domestic, the domestic policy agenda in this space. And of course, our project, um, which maps the Media Ecosystem Observatory, Peter and Mai's are co-PI on this um, internet observatory. Um, we do work in the journalism policy space, which is obviously kind of taking off globally right now, where countries are kind of dealing with this market failure of journalism. Um, work on the kids in tech policy agenda and increasingly on the climate and tech policy agenda. So I think it, I should say, say that to say that we're, when one talks about platform governments or digital governance generally, um, it's a pretty sweeping broad agenda. And we're kind of trying to build um, connective tissue at the center between academics and researchers and civil society working in these various spaces and the policymakers who as I'm gonna talk about are increasingly kind of diving in head first into this space. So what I'm gonna present now is kind of the work that uh, I've been doing with two colleagues at my center, Helen Hayes, who's here, um, and Sonia Solomon um, kind of map this space. So first though, I think it's worth articulating or stating clearly that we are in this kind of unique public policy making moment. Um, and we're in a very different place than we were just a five years ago. Um, there was not a big push in the same way we're seeing to, um, e for any form of big, large scale, comprehensive digital governance, let alone governance that's specifically directed to platforms, which I'll, which I'll talk about in a second. And I, th I think some things have really changed in this last five years that have changed this policy calculus. I mean, one is that just there's just a, a much wider societal understanding of potential harm stemming from our digital ecosystem and our digital infrastructure. Um, this has been driven by, I would say, journalism and civil society, creating this awareness of harms around the world and has brought attention to polarization and radicalization, some of the toxicity and harmful speech issues, challenges around the reliability of information, um, election integrity issues, mental health issues, and childhood development, um, threats to individual privacy and increasingly individual agency, and declining kind of competition in our in our digital economy. And I, I say that just to say that all of these things are are debated, and researchers are trying to understand the exact mechanisms at play in each of them. But the knowledge of these harms is increasingly real and felt by citizens. Um, as part of our, our uh, Commission on Democratic Expression, we also run a Citizens Assembly every year where 42 Canadians, in parallel with the Commission, deliberate on the same question we're working through. And it has been immensely eye-opening to see just like the visceral nature with which citizens feel some of these harms uh, 
and are increasingly demanding policy action. And I think governments are starting to feel that in a way really they weren't um, just a few years ago. So that public opinion on these issues is really changing. And combined with that public opinion changing and demanding this kind of policy action, um, the political calculus for it has also has sub subsequently changed, right? That um, this, this idea that the, this, this infrastructure was aligned with democratic goods is shifting. Um, it's shifting among the populace, and it's importantly shifting among politicians um, who now actually see both maybe a misalignment between some democratic goods and these technologies. Um, and also because the population's shifting, they see a political incentive to govern, which isn't, is rarely, is not often the case, right? When we're seeing like real, real sort of uprising from the public to demand policy action from governments um, in a space that actually governments assumed up until recently, the public didn't want. And, and that's a real change too. And so the result of this has just been in the past few years, this flurry of policymaking around the world. And, and I'm going to focus in on this analysis to policies that have, that have been um, implemented or proposed recently in the past two or three years in, um, in uh, mainly transatlantic countries. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that framing after. But um, we have just seen a flurry of public policy. And it is very difficult to understand or to comprehend even as people who work sort of actively in this space, what is going on? How to make sense of this map of policymaking? Um, it, it's, a, it's a very difficult exercise. It crosses jurisdictions, it crosses domains of policymaking, it crosses scales of different types of jurisdiction. And, uh, and it's a real problem, frankly, um, for us to assess what's working and what isn't, what should be applied in other contexts and other jurisdictions and how to understand the implications of these policies being implemented. So with, with all that sort of preamble, I'm, I'm just gonna do three things here. And the, and the first is I wanna describe why people are starting to use, I think, uh, or what they mean by a frame of platform governance. Um, and I think in many ways, it's an attempt to make sense of and to categorize these disparate policy agendas. And, it may, I mean, I think it does do that. And I'm gonna show, show, I think, how it does that. Um, but it also could provide us a lens to assess and compare how they're being implemented and whether they're being implemented effectively um, across this broad space. So the idea of platform governance is, is still, um, I would say, in development or iterating. As I said, there's sort of hundreds of academics who are kind of opting in to talking about our digital ecosystem through this lens. Um, but broadly, I think we could say it's a policy approach focusing explicitly on online platforms. And we can talk about what we mean by those as a distinct layer in our digital infrastructure that warrant new regulatory and legal oversight. So there's something different about this layer of global online platforms that that warrants a different lens and a different policy focus in particular. And the promise here is that it can provide a framework with which we connect a wide range of different policies that we could potentially bring together very siloed policy communities into a comprehensive governance agenda. Because as we know, you know better than I do, like the digital policy agenda is deeply, deeply fragmented across different regulatory agencies, um, pieces of legislation and even departments and mandates. Um, and it, it could, I think as well, provide us with a lens or a framework to coordinate um, and learn from um, in between governments implementing these policies. So I think there's three things worth highlighting about platform governance and what it what it can provide us as an analytic lens. Um, one is that it sees the digital policy agenda as being three separate categories of policy topics. A set of policies that sit under a content framing. So these are things like content moderation policies, illegal speech moderation, 
potentially demand side support for journalistic production, a whole host of policies that sit around like, how do we incentivize good content and disincentivize bad content? There's a data category, which gets kind of the underlying data that fuels the platform ecosystem. And this could be everything from modernized data regulations to algorithmic accountability mechanisms, whole host of different data policies, and then a set of market-oriented competition policies. So how do we make the digital economy function as a more efficient market, either through mergers and acquisitions, limitations, antitrust policy, potentially any tax measures. And what's critical, I think, about this framework is that it says, one, it gives us sort of a way to talk about these policies that isn't all in one big mess, frankly. It categorizes them and allows us to speak to them within the communities that have knowledge of those systems and the regulatory and legal agencies that address them. But it also makes it clear that this agenda, it needs to be comprehensive, that there, literally, there really is no silver bullet to the platform policy space we to do things across these three different themes altogether. And this is, of course, really hard for governments, and we can get into some of the challenges in a minute. But it's, it, this comprehensive nature of it is really important. Um, the second is it allows us to see different scales of policies. So, some policies are clearly going to be national in this area. So speech policy, for example, or a legal speech policy will be by definition national because our laws around speech are, have evolved over, um, over decades or sometimes hundreds of years, and they are nationally determined. Um, and so we are not going to see one standardized online speech law, for example, for, multiple, for the world. It's just not going to happen. Um, some policies are coordinated or can be coordinated. So an example of this would be something like uh, uh, modernized data privacy law. So GDPR could impose a new data privacy law for Europe, and Canada could um, decide to align our modernized policy law with GDPR in order to be compliant, but also just to create a global standard. Um, other policies might actually be done together. Like they might actually be where countries will decide on those policies together. And something like the OECD new um, digital tax rate might be that, right? Where you have a number of countries coming together and setting a common policy together in order to create the mar enough market weight, frankly, to force compliance um, by companies. And the final variable here I think is worth considering is if you think about the potentially dozens of policies that could sit across those three different domains, they are a very varying um, either risk or frankly difficulty. Um, some of this stuff, like I would say something like ad transparency is incredibly easy to do. Um, other things like content moderation policy for misinformation um, informed by legislation might be immensely difficult. Um, and I think we need to see these policies in that kind of spectrum, particularly when we decide, when governments decide what to do first. Okay, so what does it mean to apply that lens to things that have happened in a host of countries over the past few years? Um, I am scared to show this next slide, but I will. Um, that is one way of looking at it. And don't worry, I am not going to make you squint to see that. Um, I'm going to go through it in a second. Um, but this is just an attempt by us to use that framing of content, data, and competition policies, the framework of whether it is the jurisdiction that it's being imposed in, national, coordinated, or international, the degree of difficulty, um, and where it is in the legislative process across a host of different countries. And I want to go a few just to show you what I mean and, and maybe I hope um, draw some kind of conclusions out of, of what this, where this space is from this analysis. So first we should start with the EU. The EU is obviously a jurisdiction that is moving the fastest in this direction um, and has two pieces of legislation at the moment that, direct, that are both directly um, focused at platforms the Digital Market Agreement, which is their updated essentially competition policy 
which will aims to create what they're calling a European digital market. Um, it's directed specifically at gatekeepers um, of that digital economy, what they're defined as large platforms. And it gives sweeping powers to a new European wide digital commissioner who will enforce a whole set of new competition provisions across the European market with very stiff, the, the highest penalties we've seen yet in any new legislative um, package, 10% uh, of global revenue for abuses of obligations under this new act. Um, I think a lot of people thought that this was gonna be very difficult to pass and was gonna take a long time to pass. Um, in fact, it has not, it's gone quite quickly. Um, and from what I hear, Macron really wants it to happen before the election. So we may actually get this in effect um, very soon. Um, the partner to that act, so if, um, if we think of the competition piece, the, um, the content piece of the European legislation is the Digital Services Act, which at its core seeks to harmonize the takedown and notice mechanisms that already are starting to exist across European countries. And it basically creates a common enforcement mechanism across Europe for those national takedown regimes. And that's something really important to note that I'll, I'll come back to in a minute. Um, so they're using national laws around illegal speech, but they're creating the power of the European uh, Commission to enforce those takedown regimes. So, the, so the, the jurisdiction is the state, but the enforcement mechanism is, the, is at the commission level. Um, this one has proven incredibly contentious in part because they keep adding things to it. And the platforms have, have I think, not um, lost a number of the kind of lobbying fights that they thought they were gonna win. Um, an interesting example of this is um, the mandatory ad transparency provisions that were fought over at the last minute. I think platforms thought they were going to get rid of them and they didn't. They ended up in this thing. And so it's probably going to drag it out for a little longer um, than people anticipated. Um, but if you think of GDPR as handling the data column of our platform governance frame, the DMA gets at the market mechanisms and the competition piece and the DSA gets at um, at the content side. Two other things have happened in Europe that are worth flagging quickly. One is, and, and people on this call would know a lot more about this than I would, but it's worth flagging that the AI Act is at the same time as they're doing all this, the AI, AI Act is working its way through um, the EU as well. And the one thing that they do in a, I think is interesting to note um, is it, it's a really good example of differential regulation for different use cases. Um, they've pretty clearly scoped out a regulatory regime for, they, for well, uh, not really a regime because they ban certain use cases of, a, of AI. Um, they flag high risk use cases, which are subject to kind of the full weight of the regulatory regime and low risk uses, which will be very light touch. And I think in many of the things we're gonna talk about through these different countries, that, that differential regulatory frame is something that's really important to flag. The last thing on the EU that's interesting is that the, these is to note that these sweeping acts um, have a life of their own and play out over time. Um, and GDPR is a great example of that. that it set a framework for a new data regime, which is still evolving rapidly. And just last, just last week, two big rulings um, of the uh, Court of Justice on pop-up ads and like consent and pop-up ads for, the news, for news organizations and on transatlantic data transfers have totally changed the way platforms can operate in Europe. And those are like a function of GDPR years later playing out through court rulings. Um, okay, let's move a little faster through this. I want to spend a bit of time on the EU though, because it really is kind of an, a kind of regulatory entrepreneur here. Okay, um, Germany and France are worth flagging sitting underneath the EU. So in the EU, you of course have these twin jurisdictions. Um, two things to note about Germany and France. One, 
they have both tried to implement on the content side, ex post takedown regimes. So regimes that would enforce the takedown of certain types of content after it is posted. NetsDG puts a 24 hour timeline on this. Any content flagged as illegal to a platform needs to be taken down within 24 hours. Um, it has had mixed success, which we can I'll talk about a bit more about why that it points to some of the challenges in that kind of regulation. Um, and the French law, Avia, was sort of partially struck down by their constitutional council, um, but still exists in some form. Um, but that, that really quick takedown notice um, was stripped, um, as well as the, what, they've actually put an even more rigid one, a one hour takedown notice for terrorist content and child pornography that was also deemed unconstitutional. So interesting to note, both Germany and France have both gone that route of ex post and park that for a second, because I'll come back to that ex post model. Um, on the competition side, it's pretty safe to say German antitrust law has been the, the, the quickest and most aggressive in shifting from a uh, price metric of consumer harm to a broader conception of um, of consumer harm, which is where a lot of different competition commissions and bureaus are going. And I'll, I'll talk more a bit more into that again. They were kind of the entrepreneur of that. And on the competition side, um, the French have imposed a similar thing to the um, news bargaining code in Australia, which is much lighter, which I'll talk about now for a second. So Australia. Australia has um, also gone with a um, ex post takedown regime. Um, they do not just enforce it on platforms, but they enforce it on um, platforms, ISPs, and app distributors. So in some ways, it's even more encompassing. Um, and they focus on um, five categories of illegal speech. This will look similar because it's similar to what the Canadian government proposed last year, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, that is being implemented as we speak. Um, and it gets often overshadowed by the fight that occurred about the news bargaining code, which is um, in the competition bucket of platform policies. Um, essentially what the um, competition regulator um, in Australia imposed was a uh, mandate that, um, that, or a directive that publishers and Australian publishers and pl um, platforms that sell, they, that aggregate um, content from those publishers and sell ads against it, um, need to enter into um, negotiations over um, licensing fees for that content. And if they fail to come to agreement, then a forced arbitration um, uh, provision kicks in and the Competition Bureau oversees that negotiation. This caused a lot of controversy because Facebook kind of shut down news on the site um, for a number of days, threatened to leave the market. Um, and um, it has had mixed effect, I think we could say. We can talk more about that later if anybody wants to talk about that. Two, two more. I'm just going to do the UK and Canada, and then I'll, uh, I'll move on to some conclusions here. Um, the UK, I mean, Brexit has presented some interesting regulatory challenges for the UK, obviously, in every aspect of British law and regulation, um, and the digital space is no exception. Um, but they have done some interesting things. Um, if you think of that French, Australian, German model of ex post content moderation and takedown regimes, um, the British have developed a different model, um, which is what they call a duty of care, which creates a statutory responsibility uh, much like exists on other private sector actors on platforms to act responsibly. Um, now, obviously, that's a very vague um, articulation, but is one that will be um, likely um, uh, determined through um, courts. And um, they have, through this online harm, so it's, they create this sort of statutory responsibility, and then they've built out a fairly significant regulator to oversee three categories of content, illegal content. And again, 
that differential idea, so different types of content, illegal content, services likely to be accessed by children, which is, I think, the most significant um, element of this. They have moved from content that is shown to be seen by children or is known to be seen by children, which are the provisions of COPA, which is largely what we fall under in Canada or some similar version of, which is the American law on child content, um, to services that are likely to be seen by children, which, take, which presents an entirely different risk assessment, particularly when you put that duty of care lens on top of it to platforms. They need to make a determination if content on their platform is likely to be seen by a user, by kids, and then do an assessment of whether it will be harmful to them as part of their statutory responsibility. Um, they've also placed, re placed really um, extensive and far-reaching audit powers, similar to what the financial sector regulators have, um, into uh, Ofcom. So Ofcom now has these very aggressive, um, intrusive audit powers of the way platforms function um, that they will be able to apply. Um, another thing to note about the, the, this, um, the British online harms process is that and this Canada can, can really learn, and I'll, I'll talk about Canada in a second, um, is that uh, the process for developing these kinds of regulatory regimes really, really matters. Um, we're talking about placing new rules and regulations over um, very sensitive areas that touch on speech, that touch on collective action, that touch on democratic participation. Um, and the idea that this can be developed in secret without widespread public consultation um, and engagement is, I think, foolhardy. Um, so the British process was to develop a white paper that was published publicly, and a whole host of academics fed into that white paper. Um, there was a consultation on that white paper, widespread. A draft legislation was created out of that, just to put some some articulation to how this could look. And then interestingly, um, they were trying to decide where to put it in terms of committee review um, inside um, the British Parliament. Um, and they thought that there was no obvious committee that had the kind of both broad buy-in um, across uh, parties, political parties, and expertise to evaluate a piece of legislation like this. So they created an, uh, a new select committee that ended up spending six months, heard 200 witnesses, and reported back on their recommendations with a pretty sweeping report um, just uh, about a month or so ago. And the broad consensus, I would say, um, is that those recommendations improved the piece, the legislation. <laughs> And it now has significant buy-in, and I think is very likely to pass. Um, and I think there's some real lessons there. The process matters. Okay. Um, okay, I lied. I was going to talk about the United States quickly. The only thing I will say about the U.S., um, they have largely been out of this um, policy discussion. Part of the reason we have a largely unregulated internet is because the US um, allowed it to become that um, for a whole host of reasons. Um, but I think a couple of things are happening in the US that are interesting. One is um, America takes free markets very seriously. And um, if you place a trust in social and economic outcomes in the efficiency of the market, which the United States clearly does, then it demands the market function efficiently um, and competition policy becomes really important, which is why we've seen historically when distortions in those markets emerge, um, US antitrust policy has really reshaped industrial markets in meaningful ways. And I think we're starting to see that with these platforms. And it's sort of encompassed under this kind of neo-Brandesian school of antitrust policy, which sees um, price is a bad indicator or a limited indicator of consumer harm for what are ultimately free products. One of the kind of um, leading thinkers on that has been Lena, Lena Kahn, who's now head of the FTC. So here you have a chairwoman of the FTC who is a leading proponent of a pretty radically different notion of consumer harm that could underlie future antitrust cases um, by the American government. And that's a major change 
Um, in addition to that, you're getting a set, a set of different Senate um, proposals to um, give more powers to those same regulatory agencies, more market study powers, bigger budgets, more enforcement capacity to these very agencies that are shifting their notion of consumer harm. So things will happen there almost invariably. They'll be slow, um, but they're beginning to happen. And you're already seeing, I would say, I mean, the, the flip side of, of these kinds of big regulatory shifts is that sometimes they don't even have to be enforced to, 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 to lead to um, change. And I think um, the very fact that this uh, limitation, this new assessment of mergers, for example, is likely to be applied by the FTC, I think has stemmed the flow in acquisitions and mergers that were happening for the past three or four years in the tech sector. Um, I bet we see far fewer of these um, this year because companies just know they're they're likely to to face totally different levels of scrutiny. Um, okay, let's talk about Canada for a second. So, um, the very quickly in the data policy space, I mean, people on call I know far more about this than I do. Um, but we will likely see a new version of C11, the update to um, our data privacy regime, the Digital Charter Implementation Act. Um, it, as you know, came out and was heavily criticized for a whole host of different reasons um, and then disappeared. And I, I would like to know from people here why that happened. Um, it was sort of sidelined, um, frankly, in our last parliament. And I, I don't know fully why, um, but we will likely see that in, in this parliament. Um, on the competition side, um, our competition commissioner is, has been very vocal over the past couple of years about his lack of power, um, partly sitting under ICID now, not having his own sort of um, his, own, um, his own powers. And he has asked for greater market study power. He's asked for greater penalties or, or sort of um, ability to penalize um, for non-infringement or for, um, for infringements of a competition act. Um, and the uh, federal minister of ICED has now just announced that there's gonna be a review of the competition act. And I think this is a, a function of that pressure, both from um, various uh, civil society actors who are pointing to the fact we have not modernized our Competition Act when other countries clearly have, um, and, are and that's where it's kind of this, this new trend of competition enforcement is headed, um, and the demands of, this, of the commissioner himself um, for greater power. So that's going to happen this year. Um, we proposed a digital services tax of 3% of Canadian revenue in excess of $20 million in Canada. Um, it's uncertain whether that will be actually implemented given the new OECD standard tax rate that was negotiated. Um, they may both happen. If that happens, the platforms are gonna freak out. Um, and the US will too, frankly. Um, and broadly in the competition space, you could probably consider some of our journalism support packages because they're very clearly market correction mechanisms. The labor tax subsidy is a significant subsidy of 25% of journalistic labor. Um, going to journalistic organizations. And the mandate letter, the, this round of mandate letters to the Minister of Heritage included in its first 100 days um, directive the implementation of the Australian model of news bargaining codes in Canada. So we are very likely to see that in the next, I would say, two weeks probably. Um, it's it's going to happen. Uh, what it looks like exactly is, is still in them. Um, okay. Uh, the last thing I'll say about Canada, and then I'll move on to some broader points here. Um, where Canada has gotten in the most trouble, where um, I think they have gone um, the most off course here is in the, um, is in the content sphere. Um, it's worth flagging that we did do some things in the Election Modernization Act. Um, a man we created a mandatory ad archive, limited foreign digital money in the ad market, um, lowered our digital spending caps, um, for digital ads, which all of which um, I think probably made some difference in terms of election, um, some of the, the 
maybe limiting some of the clearest vectors of, of election interference. Um, but the bigger package here was uh, released as part of a consultation paper in the summer, the online harms consultation um, paper. Um, through the, the Commission on Democratic Expression, we had recommended against a 24-hour takedown regime, the X post model, and recommended something like a British duty of care model. Um, but the government went the other way. They suggested an illegal takedown regime, illegal content takedown regime, much like Germany, for five categories of illegal content, hate speech, child exploitative content, non-consensual sharing of intimate images, incitement to violence, and terrorist content. Um, so we can, we can dive more into this in the conversation, but I, I would just say a couple of things. Um, one is, I think they got some of the architecture right. Um, they proposed a digital safety commissioner, so a, a new independent regulator, um, as opposed to embedding this in the CRTC, um, like the UK did with Ofcom. Uh, they proposed a resource council, like some sort of rapid turnaround of, um, count, uh, oversight board or e-tribunal to adjudicate on some of these, these content decisions. And they recommended an advisory board, what a lot of people have called a social media council, which is like an external stakeholder group that would advise, um, perhaps based on large scale data access in part, um, the, uh, the regulator. So I think there's nothing inherently bad with that architecture. The question is how it's empowered. And I think my view is that the government got three things um, wrong. One um, was the 24 hour takedown regime, which clearly um, presents challenges to digital rights, potential over censorship, and frankly, just implementation. It's incredibly difficult to implement. And it gets them into this regulating speech space, which uh, is a pretty treacherous place for governments. They put an IP blocking provision in it, which basically said that if a if a, if a if a company or a platform is non-compliant, then the last resort would be mandated IP blocking from telecoms, which is um, a bit of a red line um, around net neutrality and would give pretty sweeping powers to telecoms um, that could in theory be used for other things. Um, so that's a bit of a red flag. And they included data sharing, mandatory data sharing requirements between platforms and Canadian security agencies. And this, I think, rightly got um, critiqued from various anti-hate groups who have been subject to these very kinds of data sharing agreements um, before and were raising sort of red flags about that. So I think those are the big things that I think they got wrong, right and wrong or broadly right and possibly wrong. But at the end of the day, it comes down to this issue of ex ante versus ex post. And the Canadian approach really did focus on that ex post approach. And where I'm going to say, I'll com make comment in a second that directionally where we're headed, I think, in this entire governance agenda is towards those ex ante approaches. Okay, so let me just end with a few comments about this broad agenda. Um, one is um, platform governance as a, a policy frame or as even a, an academic discipline emerging um, or as a focal point for civil society. Um, has a has a massive transatlantic bias. And I just fell into that, right? I just talked about um, countries that um, are are large, could be largely defined as as transatlantic, advanced democracies. Um, that being said, I think we can say some things about how that set of countries have implemented this agenda. I think we're starting to see, um, real alignment amongst data protection regulations. Um, and it will all be built on iterations of GDPR. I think that is out of the bag. Um, I think we're seeing convergence around interpretations of competition policy. Um, and that broader notion of consumer harm is going to take hold in my up across those countries. We're clearly starting to see coordination there. Um, but there are real divides across those countries around how they're going to deal with content and whether they're gonna get in the game of content moderation or not. And then the question is, if this is what's happening in the, this set of countries, 
which are really taking the lead on these broad comprehensive agendas. I mean, these are huge changes to government. It's creating big and new institutions. It's changing core regulatory and legal mechanisms that governments have used to the digital economy. Um, how will the trends that occur in those transatlantic countries extend to other democratic countries? That's thing one. Um, thing two is that a number of countries have fallen into this, I think, distraction of moderating content. And I think it's, it's really understandable why governments want to do this. The bad things online are the things that citizens feel viscerally. It's the things they see. And it's the thing, frankly, that governments see, that politicians see. It's, and it's an easy thing to document and demonstrate. It's felt most viscerally. Um, and it also has these parallels to things we've made illegal already. Certain kinds of speech are already illegal. So the impetus from governments is to say, why can't we stop them on the internet? And I think this is a distraction. Um, it's a distraction because the things the governments would have to do, the infrastructure they'd have to put in place in order to actually accomplish that have pretty wide ranging implications for over censoring, for free speech, for the ways in which those regimes can be weaponized to silence others. And ultimately, it just creates this kind of whack strategy for bad things. The government has some say in determining, which is probably a place we should be cautious at going. Which brings me to my third point, is I think the governance strategies on the content side that get this right or get this more right, and I think this is where the trend is going, certainly with Europe it is, um, and I hope it will here too, is towards ex-ante policies that focus on the structure and incentive and business models of these, these systems that may exacerbate that negative speech. And here we're starting to see real focuses on transparency regimes, forced algorithmic transparency, for example, human rights audits, greater market study power by regulators, impact, algorithmic impact assessments, things that get at that structure, um, mandated data sharing, probably differential with different types of researchers and journalists to help better understand these systems, universal ad transparency, so we can bring this like opaque world of ad targeting and micro-targeting out into some form of daylight, and real empowerment mechanisms for citizens, including meaningful consent, which clearly doesn't exist, real digital literacy campaigns, and real forms of data portability and interoperability. It's like, that's, I think, the direction that the content side of this, which is the most difficult bucket of those three, is headed, I think. Um, a couple more quick points here. One, if that's the case, if government intervention in the content space, government regulation moves to the ex ante, the ex post, I think, is going to be pushed largely to self-regulatory regimes. And this is where things like the Facebook Oversight Board become interesting. I don't think in and of itself it's, it's that interesting. But if governments get out of that business almost entirely and large-scale platforms now have a duty of care if that British model takes hold, so they have a statutory responsibility and a liability, in fact, if they don't act responsibly, then I think we might see actual collaboration potentially on those self-regulatory approaches for ex post moderation of content because they are gonna need to show they're taking that seriously. And you may even see like, it's not impossible that the US put some sort of conditional um, provision on intermediary, intermediary, intermediary liability in the United States. And if that's the case, if they move beyond blanket liability protection under Section 230 and to some sort of conditional protection and other countries adopt a duty of care responsibility, then that burden is now placed on platforms to get this content moderation stuff right. And I don't know how that's going to play out, um, but platforms also have far greater leeway in moderating content than governments ever could. Um, particularly in the United States, where, I mean, the First Amendment basically limits any content directives other than most extreme content from the federal government, but it doesn't do it, say anything about what platforms can do. In fact, it protects them 
for moderating content. So I think we're going to see that moderation debate move to self-regulation. Two more quick things here. One, there is a real a liberal challenge at the host of a lot of this debate. So most of what we've been talking about has been amongst democratic societies. I would flag three different forms of a liberal challenge. Um, one is what's kind of being called the hungry Poland problem of the EU. Um, remember, the DSA devolves rules about speech to the nation state and enforces it collectively at the commission level. Well, what do you do about rules of speech in Hungary and Poland that are increasingly illiberal? Does the EU then start enforcing collectively those national, arguably increasingly illiberal speech laws in Hungary and Poland? And they don't have a good answer to that. And I think it's a real challenge. The second is a set of countries which are ostensibly democratic, which are using this framing of digital governance um, to crack down on civil dissent, to uh, impose pretty draconian data collection measures, and a whole set of surveillance apparatus that I think we should be deeply worried about. Um, Singapore and India are a part of this, but there are others as well. The third is a bigger geopolitical issue um, around a liberal a liberalism and the liberal regulation of technology, which is somewhat different. And I we don't have time to get into this really, but um, the proposition I think that the a chi set of Chinese companies is offering to a liberal leaning regimes around the world goes far beyond a liberal leaning regimes imposing undemocratic laws and actually gives them a stack of technologies to control citizen populations in their entirety. And if I am in a liberal leading regime, um, that is a probably a pretty um, attractive proposition. Why use a Western stack of technologies and try and regulate it to my interests when I could use a separate set of technologies that allow me full control? And we are starting to see a number of countries fall down that path. Um, I lied, there's two more quick things. One, we are not seeing a lot of global cooperation here. And I think that is something that is gonna change. Um, I think it's, one could make the case and uh, Rohit Medora and I, um, President CG have written a number of articles about this that um, we are starting to see a disconnect between our technological infrastructure and the capacities and behaviors that it enables and our governance institutions, similar to the disconnect that existed in the Bretton Woods moment. When we saw a new set of institutions emerge, um, kind of purpose built for the post war industrial economy. And I think there's a case to be made that we need some of those now, too. I won't get into these, but I do think if you're to mirror some of those institutions that were built in that Bretton Woods moment, you can actually see some real analogs now. Um, we could get some sort of uni universal declaration around AI. We need new forums for data balkanization, new statistical regimes. New, new global tax regimes, and some sort of equivalent probably to the Financial Stability Board that coordinates policies in this space. Or we can get into any of that, but it's, just, it, it's, it's, a, it's a related aspect of this. So like, we're talking a lot about national policies, but at some level there's gonna need to be most likely new forms of, of international um, governance regimes or global governance regimes. Final thing last on is a couple of just really quick things to watch for, I think, in the very near term. I think it's it's pretty clear that the EU is kind of the regulatory innovator here. The DSA and the DMA will likely be in effect within a year, and that's remarkable. Like Those are two sweeping pieces of legislation in this space. Um, I think the US is serious about market power, and that's going to have real spin-off effects. Um, these companies are, the, if we're talking about the platform ecosystem, these companies leave aside the Chinese platform companies. The, Amer the Western democratic, largely used platform companies are American. And if the US gets serious about this, it has big implications for everybody. Um, I think there's something interesting happening amongst Commonwealth countries, a narrow set of Commonwealth countries. Um, it's, it's very difficult, I find, to talk about the EU to a Canadian policymaker, for example, because the EU is a different kind of governance entity. We don't really have an equivalent and it. There's no clear analogy. But when you explain that a 
um, a piece of legislation was proposed and reviewed by the British Parliament and was enforced through a regulatory agency that looks a lot like ours, it's much easier to have that coordination and learning conversation. And I think you're starting to see, see that amongst Australia, Canada, the UK, I put New Zealand in there for sure. Um, and I think we're gonna start seeing more coordination between those countries. Um, I think the geopolitics of this are real and uh, that's a bit much bigger conversation, um, but I am deeply concerned about that adoption of um, what are ultimately, I think, an illiberal, an illiberal st stack of te technologies coming from China by countries that are already slipping that direction. And the last thing is there's so much going on in this space that there is an opportunity for governments to learn from each other. And that's kind of the kind of note of optimism here is that I think um, Canada, in, in part by being quite slow on a lot of these, does have the opportunity to learn from some experiments here. We now know that NetsDG in Germany had some negative impl implications. So the solution to that is not to replicate that um, as the government proposed to do, but instead to learn from it and iterate on it. And you are starting to see this kind of policy iteration in this space emerge um, that in my view is really interesting, frankly, how governments, uh, how researchers can study the implication of these policies and governments can learn from each other if that connective tissue is there. And part of the challenge is that in other domains of policymaking that have been around for a long time, there are those forums for sharing that information. Um, we have them in the terrorism space, counterterrorism space, and national security space, clearly. We have them in economic policymaking, but we don't really have those like connective networks in the digital policy space. And so it makes that learning harder. And I think that's part another direction we probably need to go is creating more of that connective tissue amongst governments struggling with this agenda. Okay, I'm gonna leave it there. And look, happy to talk about any and all this. Sorry, it was kind of high level and sweeping, but this space is at the moment. Thanks very, very much, Taylor. Uh, I'll just say that if I, if I only had 45 minutes to live, I'd want you to give a talk because I'd get an extra 10, which would be great. Um, this is really, this is really something. Uh, I'm going to open it up to questions. If you have questions, just go, go ahead and put your hand up, uh, the virtual hand, and uh, I'll call on it. Um, and if I don't see it right away, I'm actually going to go to to, uh, to Jillian Hadfield first because I know you've got a question on regulation. Oh, I, lots and lots, lots and lots. Thanks, Taylor. That was uh, really terrific, and yeah, uh, the the overview was great. And um, can I? I've have, have got a paper. I, I want. I, I do want the table. I want the. This want is, the will table. be a paper. It will be a paper. Okay. Soon. Good. 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 That's great. Because I think it is really important to see the landscape, and it's really helpful to see the ways in which you're, you know, you know, start, starting to create that taxonomy of what are the approaches mm. that are being being taken here. Yeah. And I I, I want to. Um, uh, follow up on a key thing about the ex post versus ex ante yep. okay. um, uh, point, because I, I completely agree with you um, that we need to be thinking about uh, how do we design the, the, the structures that will get us to a place where there's this lower volume of this stuff out there rather than, I mean, I, you know, I, I think it's, it's sort of spit in the ocean, the, the takedown regime yep. approach. Um, it has the, the problems you identify. I mean, I tend to focus on the implementation one you mentioned, which is like, yeah, I mean, the yeah. volumes of these things. I think, I, think, I think regulators around the world really haven't come to grips with the volumes we're talking about, the size of the systems, the complexity yeah. of the systems that are, that are running this. Um, and so, so I wanted to hear a little bit more. You said, so I think we should be focusing on an ex ante. Um, so I, I'd like to hear a little bit more about what you think that involves. I heard you say incentives. I heard you say business yeah. model. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't think you and I have talked about this, but for me, there's a massive technological challenge um, and that we think we have to figure yeah. out how we incentivize the, the creation of the technologies that can help, help us solve this problem. Could you just say more about the ex-ante approach that you're thinking about? Yeah, I mean, like, I think it's a... I think you're right. It's like if the content moderation side is complicated, like getting at the machinery also is. Like there's no question. Um, but I, in my view, I think you have to look at the some of the components that we might think could be contributing to harm. <laughs> and in one sense, um, 
that is probably data itself, the collection of data itself, and greater regulation about what can and can't be collected. Um, there's a big push, obviously, for transparency of data and for sharing of data with researchers. Interestingly, on our commission, Wendy uh, Chun's on it, and her argument is constantly, well, like just because the platform's collected doesn't mean it should be given to researchers. In fact, maybe they shouldn't be collecting some of this stuff to begin with, right? So like the very root cause might be greater limitations on data collection by platforms themselves, or at least new mechanisms for consent for better opt-in. I mean, we saw what happened when Apple put meaningful consent on top of data tracking in iOS, 90 plus percent of users opted out. I mean, that was the first time most users had been presented with real consent, meaningful consent, I would argue, about what they wanted to be tracked and not on their phones. Um, so I think that's at the base level that's there. Then I think there's a set of initiatives or mechanisms around the way algorithms function and don't function. And I think there's a lot of rhetoric around this that somehow algorithms are putting us in filter bubbles or putting us in or leading to radicalization of, um, of the content we receive or whatever it might be. Um, I think the answer to those is we really just don't know. And um, just like in the finance sector, we demand auditing of automated systems and algorithmic systems. I don't see any reason why that can't be demanded in this system. Like, yes, it's complicated. And to your point about technical expertise, yes, it is technically difficult, but we do it in the financial sector and it's highly intrusive and it's highly technical. I don't see why we can't do it here. In fact, when Ofcom, in preparation for the online harms legislation, which has re very invasive auditing provisions of algorithmic systems, they are now trying to hire people to do that. And one of the things they found is that the civil servant pay scale just didn't allow them to hire these people. So they've now been given an exemption from that to hire people with the kind of technological capacity you'd need to actually audit and black box these algorithmic systems. So like that I think is a one direction we'll probably see going. The, the flip side of that is these kinds of internal mandated harm assessments and I think human rights assessment and algorithmic harm assessments. That if you put a duty of care on platforms, it is all of a sudden in their, in their um, incentive to demonstrate that they've tested the potential negative use of these algorithmic changes or these system-wide design changes. You place that burden on them. And so it, and I think that's important because in many ways, as you say, they're the ones who have the technical capacity to do this. They have the access to data to do it. So when Facebook does a, a voluntary human rights audit, for example, um, they learned all sorts of things about how their system was exacerbating certain human rights um, abuses on their system. And they're not making some changes in response to that. But why couldn't that be mandated? Or why couldn't the burden be placed on them to do it rather than just public pressure or whatever it might be, right? And I think that's probably another place we could go. On the financial model, so, sorry, this is a long-winded answer, but it's it's pretty sweeping approach I think that might be needed here. On the financial side, I mean, there's a trope that it's the business model that's causing these problems. And I think, I think there's probably some truth to that. Um, part of it you get through potential algorithmic audits, right? Because you can start to see what kind of content is being amplified or not, um, which is part, which is the sort of um, keeping people on the site side of this. Um, but the other piece is, is just the targeted advertising system. And um, I think the best way of getting at that is just through transparency. Like I don't see any reason why you couldn't have mandated um, ad archives. Now, like that's a debate in Peter will have something to say about this because like there's constitutional issues there, or charter issues in Canada. Um, I think the Election Modernization Act put that mandatory ad archive on election ads, but the government at the time was worried about doing it for all ads all the time because they were worried about a charter challenge. So I, I think there might be some limitations there. Um, other people seem to think it will survive that kind of challenge. So, so I don't know, but that's another way of getting at the money side of this, I think. I hope that's helpful, but look, I think there's a lot of ways in there, but, but even just focusing our conversation on those ex-ante issues, 
takes us to a very different kind of conversation than if we talk about getting rid of bad things. Yeah, I, I guess I'd want to push a little harder to, to talk about, you know, like, how are you going to get those? So the technologies for content moderation, for auditing, um, and so on for, for that aggressive, that, that's actually, you know, it's a, it's a really hard nut to crack. And I think we, you know, it's true that a duty of care would create some incentives yeah. for that to happen internally. What I worry about with that is it's a black box. Like it's actually, you know, it, well, okay. So what, what, do, what, what are they actually t testing? How are they doing for, it? For sure, how, for sure. how can we get this into independent, technologically sophisticated regulators who are working uh, on a, you know, in that market environment where they're getting the, the you know, attracting the investment and attracting yeah. the capacity to, um, to hire those uh, mm. uh, tech folks. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, this is sort of just, you know, my pitch is like, we need this, we need this, you know, technologically sophisticated regulatory sector that is working, yeah. you know, under the oversight of government, but that is independent, like, um, independent of uh, the companies you're trying to regulate. Because see, it, that's it's interesting because and independent from government, maybe. So, I mean, there's one model where the a regulator, regulatory body has this capacity. Part of what you're seeing in the EU and certainly around GDPR um, cases is kind of, as you say, a quiet space of auditing emerging where there is that deep capacity and the markets kind of creating that space. So can you build incentives to create that, those sort of third party auditors like we have for in other sectors um, in this, right? With that deep expertise that claimants, for example, could hire to conduct an audit as part of a proceeding. And right, I, I, right. there's a bit of that emerging in Europe. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think the thing is, how do you connect that to kind of your legitimacy creating institutions that say this isn't, yeah. you know, just what Deloitte thinks uh, we should, totally. we should de deem to be acceptable content, but rather we've connected that to our political processes. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, thanks Taylor. Lot, lots to talk about. Really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. Likewise. Uh, Matthew Marinette, please. Great. Uh, thank you so much for your, your talk, uh, Taylor. It was very mm -hmm. interesting. I, I'm curious, you know, you, how you divided the sort of world of platform government governance into three buckets, right? You had data, you mm -hmm. had content and, um, and competition. I'm wondering if you see any tension these days, especially in sort of what people are calling for between the competition side and the sort of content side, because it seems like those can sometimes be in conflict because people simultaneously want more centralized, you know, content regulation. They want these big structures that allow them to take things down mm -hmm. at the same time. They constantly want you know Facebook to be broken up or to have a bunch of smaller competing platforms that maybe wouldn't yeah. be captured by you know these kinds of rules that scale based on the number of users you have in a in a given country. And so there's a simultaneous mm -hmm. tension between wanting centralization and wanting uh, decentralization. Do you see that as a problem that could be solved? Uh, uh, I mean, I'm sure it could be solved, but I agree it's a problem. Um, and I I actually think it, that points to some value in this framework, because you can actually start to see some of those trade-offs between these different elements and these different sort of policy domains. But there, there is no question that, like, why does Facebook support conditional liability on Section 230, for example? Right. They do because they know they will meet that bar because they have this huge content moderation apparatus. And it's going to be very difficult for other countries to scale that up quickly enough in order to meet that conditional status of, of liability protection, if that does, if that if that is where they go, like will Spotify have that, for example? <laughs> no, probably not right away. And they're they're already a big platform, so part of this comes down, I think, to like differential pol policies for different scales of companies. Like that's clearly going to be part of it, um, and the DMA does that in Europe. I mean they. They have some crazy, I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's like platform companies and it's like, it's like very large companies. It's like an official category and like they, they're down to like smaller intermediaries. So they have like different categories and different set of rules that'll apply to them. And we'll probably see that, but there's no question that like the idea of, I mean, this, this is not a new story either. Large companies, often monopolies, often support regulation that keep the highly intrusive, difficult regulation in order to keep out competitors, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's pretty clearly what we're seeing here too. All right. All right. Thank you. Yeah.
Lisa Austin. At some point, I'm going to put myself on the list, but Lisa, please. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks, Kelly. That was uh, super interesting. I uh, echo Jillian's comments on uh, wanting that chart, um, mm -hmm. as well as uh, the, 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 the talk mm -hmm. written up. Um, my question, I was really intrigued by the example you gave me. You said we need um, uh, better, more meaningful consent. And you talked about um, Apple now, right, um, uh, giving tools to its users mm -hmm. to opt out of um, ad tracking and how um, people have voted with their feet and done so in um, large numbers. Um, and so uh, quite apart from just the kind of the, the consent issue, what's interesting to me there is that that's an issue um, not necessarily about platforms or even consent, but about infrastructure. So there, yeah. Apple was changing its 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 operating system, and you know, uh, in the kind of mobile space, uh, yeah. uh, Google and Apple have so much um, control over what app developers can do and what um, uh, uh, advertising looks like in that um, ecosystem through yeah. the choices they make in how yeah. they create those um, uh, operating systems. And so in your categorization of things, when you talk about, you know, data and content and competition, you don't talk about infrastructure. Yeah. And yet, if you want to do things like give meaningful consent, that's a layer. It's not a platform layer, but it's a totally. really important layer that regulation has to start trying to um, uh, get at unless you think the Apple story is a story that sort of um, upholds the success of markets, right? That the market spoke and Apple responded and... Um, and, and, and they changed it. But how do we get at that infrastructure layer, I think is really um, important. I just wondered how it fit yeah. in your, your view of things. Yeah, it's interesting. So one of the projects that I mentioned at the beginning is this kind of global approaches to platform governance um, book and working group we're doing. And it started out as being a group of academics around the world working on data and competition and um, content policies with a cluster on each. And then we added an infrastructure section. So we're kind of making the case in that project that ex exactly what you just made, that like actually there's a fourth category here, it's infrastructure. The challenge I think there, which you know better than I would is like, how do you define infrastructure? And are we talking about like traditional infrastructure layers of communication technologies? Or are we beginning to see platforms as infrastructure themselves? in which case you have a layer of infrastructure on top of traditional infrastructure. And, and I, I don't have a great answer to that. I mean, like, know what you think about that, but like, is the app store infrastructure? Yeah, in many ways it is. Like they just demonstrated that they are, but it's a different kind of infrastructure than our wireless signals and our transatlantic cables, and, right? So I, I think we might need, yes, we can talk about infrastructure, but I'm not positive the way we've understood infrastructure up until now is perfectly applicable to this new layer of infrastructure. If we're going to think about this as infrastructure, do you know what I mean? But I'd like to hear what you know about this, say about this more because I, I think it's a difficult challenge. So, Till, I think this is kind of Lisa. Go ahead. I want, I want to. Oh, I was just going to say go yes. Ahead. It's a difficult challenge. I agree. <laughs> Do you have an yeah, answer I mean, to this? <laughs> uh, so let me let me put two questions to you, which, which are related in some sense, right? Mm -hmm. One is um, if if we were engaged in a in an exercise of typologizing or an exercise of taxonomy, yeah, I wonder how easy it is to come up with a definition of a platform that would capture Facebook, Google, and Twitter but not other companies that we don't regard as platforms, AT&T or, or other telcos or a mm. news network or something like yeah. that, right? Or, or, or yeah. I don't know, a Greyhound, right? Yeah. Or some, some, some yeah. transportation network. So yeah. that's another way of asking whether the, whether the lens of platform is actually helpful um, and helpful in the sense that thinking about it that way will give you common tools to deal with those mm. um, shared challenges of those companies that yep. you couldn't deal with with existing tools or existing conceptions or or yep. or typologies. So, yep. the one, so I wonder about that. Tell yep. whether the, the notion of platform yep. governance is is actually the notion of a platform is actually helpful here, and whether it will be yep. helpful five years from now. To think about these companies. That's yep. question one. And then question yep. two is, I just wonder what your intuitions about the following in the Canadian case, which I know better than any other one. Mm. We have adopted a whole series of rules for the regulation of speech 
in elections, which are actually very restrictive, right? We set out a very defined set of actors who are allowed to engage in speech during elections, just parties, and we severely constrain the groups that are allowed to engage alongside parties. And, and that speech. predates the internet. That's just, yeah, a, yeah, that's, yeah. we, we constrain right. speech in elections. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. And, yeah. and the Supreme Court has said that's okay. We've got certain views on, on how much we can spend, how much those parties can spend. Yeah. We even have adopted or have um, evolved that legislation to deal with the reality of the internet. So it used to be that you couldn't release polling results or mm -hmm. election results yep. before time because it would influence what was going on in British Columbia. Yep. That's all gone now, right? But what I wonder is the following is, and this gets to the bigger question of whether these are helpful mental models, is I wonder whether in the Canadian case, and it's probably the case in other jurisdictions because they're regularly yeah. regulating political speech, yeah. whether politicians overestimate the ease of doing this because they see themselves operating in a highly regulated environment with their own speech. And they just think, well, you know, they do it for us. Why can't we do it for others, right? Yeah. And it just misses the absolute orders of magnitude difference in the volume of speech that we're talking about and the so, diversity of speech and and, uh, and and not to mention the normative reasons for not limiting that speech yeah. when we may want to limit political speech. I mean, I don't know if that's a statement or a question, so I'll just say, don't you think at the end, it turns into <laughs> We'll just trick in the book. Um, on the last one first, I mean, I don't, I mean, that's an interesting, I haven't heard that proposition, right? Like they think it's easy to do because their speech is regulated. Like that could very well be the case, right? But like um, now they exempt themselves from all sorts of regulation, those very same regulations when it inconveniences their speech, like data collection exemptions that every other yeah. sector in society yes. Yes. has to follow, right? So like there's clearly limits to their willingness to be regulated in this space. Um, I do want, like, I, I agree with you, though, that the idea that we regulate a very specific kind of speech in elections makes it seem like it's easier to do it writ large. And even in the case of elections, like, look at the Election Modernization Act. The government mandates an ad archive for political speech. Yes and doesn't even define what political speech is. Right. They, absolve, they put that all on the platforms. So you guys figure out what political speech is, and then we're gonna like maybe hold you accountable for your decision later. And I think the platforms rightly said, you have no idea how complicated that is. In fact, or maybe you do, and you just don't wanna do it yourself. So what does Facebook do? Facebook like does a committee of people from different parties who every week evaluate created a list of what they thought was political speech. And then they ran an out, ran a, some sort of search function that found things with those speech and they put that in the archive, right? And Google kind of rightly said like, we're out, like this is crazy. We're not mm -hmm. gonna sell ads at all in the election. Mm -hmm. So like even in elections to your proposition, government didn't even like delineate how to regulate speech. So which, which I think reinforces my argument here, which is like, they should be out of the game of regulating speech. Like maybe on certain types of illegal speech, we need better mechanisms, right? Like the five categories of, of things that are already illegal to say and do that the government delineated, agreed, we need better mechanisms for enforcing those things online. Does that demand a common regulatory regime for takedown? Probably not. There's probably really specific things we can do in a very targeted way, which we already do in many ways for each of those kinds of illegal speech. It doesn't necessarily mean, or doesn't necessarily follow that if you think these five things are, are illegal and need to be enforced online, that you can extend that rationale to all bad things online that you wanna get rid of. There might just be fundamentally different mechanisms at getting at both of them. But to do that, if you move to the ex ante approach, you then have to accept the possibility that changing that incentive structure or playing with that incentive structure may not, will not get rid of all bad things. It may just make them better. And that's a risk calculus, not an absolute. And, and governments aren't good at these kinds of like risk calculuses. They like knowing that something can be stopped. And that's just not the reality here. It's or, just not the reality of the internet. Or thinking it can, right? Sure, or like building, well, thinking they can, or even more so, building a policy apparatus under the 
a, the the prop, proposition that it can, right? The claim that it can. We have right? law; things are illegal yeah. because we think all legal things that are identified can then be punished and stopped, right? Like that's just not the case in in this digital infrastructure, which maybe says something about your first point. Just quickly, like I don't know, right? Like maybe it's the case that this kind of company with the attributes it currently has doesn't exist in five years. But it does exist now. And I think a, a different kind of economic and social activity is enabled by it. Yes. So there's some, and I didn't go into the details of how people define platforms in this. And I, and we can talk, there's, there's a lot of debate about how, what exactly is a platform, right? But like, there are some things that are common, like operating in large scale globally across borders, allowing for user generated content at scale under some form of protection from liability from that user generated content, certain kinds of network effects that exist inside these systems that lead to a different kind of collective action and a different kind of economic activity. The monetization of data in new ways that, that, that demand an aggregation of mass data across your network. Right? Like those, I think though, those things make these companies in some way different. Now, what's the line between a platform and a smaller intermediary? Like we can debate that, right? Are, could these companies go away and replaced by another set? Possibly, but there is some particular, I think that's useful now. Now, do we lock in a regulatory regime as a consequence of this new type of thing that doesn't apply to other companies in the future? I mean, I think that's a legitimate risk and a legitimate point of debate. Now, I would say that some of the things we've I've aggregated under the banner of platform governance will still be applied to all sorts of different companies, like modernized data privacy regimes, I think will be lasting and are not designed specifically for platforms, right? Um, same thing with like ad transparency, like that's probably a good thing, I think. Um, regardless of who the provider of that ad is, right? Um, so, but you're right. I think that's an important caution. Yeah. Well, it's it's a it's a it's a question of it's in some ways a question of effectiveness and also fair treatment, right? There's a lot of different angles to, to look at it. Um, for sure. For sure. Jillian, I see your hand. Yes. Uh, oh, this is uh, really interesting. Well, one of the things I wanted to add, sort of a couple of things that maybe are missing from that sort yep. of the content, uh, what was it, content data and competition. Um, so one of them is, you know, agency and manipulation, which is, um, okay. so, so thinking about like, what's the harms that we've generated from the capacity? So this is sort of the surveillance capitalism mm -hmm. critique, right? That, um, you know, we, we lost control of large parts of, of the way our world is created. It's not really just content, right? It's not, it's not just, hey, I'm seeing stuff that's hateful or I'm yeah. seeing stuff that's inciting violence. You know, I'm, you know, I'm now subject to being manipulated in ways. And, yeah. and one of the reasons is I don't think it's just about data because, you know, yeah. I don't even know if it's useful to think about this as data from the, you know, it's, it, Oh, you know, Facebook knows how long my finger hovered over the trackpad, mm. um, you know, at this particular time of day with this particular uh, content in front of me. And, and it's using that to then send, I mean, to send me stuff. So I was wondering about yeah. agency and manipulation. Is that also kind of a, 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 is that a part of the framework that's missing? Relatedly, maybe I mean, let me see how to think this through. So, competition historically is about economic effects, and we've got you know now a, a strong focus on, um, you know, you, interpreting the purposes of the competition laws to be yeah. exclusively about about economic consumer surplus or whatever. Yeah. Um, and yet, we're starting to see some talk about well, wait a second, no, it's really should we've got to be taking into account that there is this anti-competitive or whatever, the, 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 the impact of the massive platform is shaping too much of our politics, our social relationships, you know, that we've now kind of got this, you know, that, that that's a consequence of size. So yeah, just some parts of the landscape, which is wondering how they fit into your picture. I mean, uh, on the last one, I mean, I think that's partly what this debate over broadening notions of consumer harm 
is trying to do is say like, this isn't just about price differentials and pure effect on consumer behavior. It's actually about a broader set of harms that could stem from market concentration. And in fact, like the, the German Competition Bureau includes data privacy violations, um, exposure to harmful speech, and things like behavioral modification, like negative behavioral modification due to mm -hmm. algorithmic systems could in theory be used as an example of the negative effects of market concentration. So I think as an example of like putting some of those broader things inside a competition framing, which so far has been very limited and limited and inapplicable in many meaningful ways to platforms where most things are free or market digital marketplaces where things are cheaper. It's very hard to make a case that Amazon leads to increased prices, for example, um, except for the case when they, well, so well, I mean, the, the, just the idea of like selling white labeled products inside a market you control leads to that product being cheaper, but clearly leads to less choice and user and consumer agency, right? So it's like, there's other things that are going on there. So I think that's on one thing. On the, on the question of agency, I mean, I don't know. I mean, in part that could be captured on various algorithmic transparency mechanisms and audits. That's what's, there's, there's, that, that's what's driving some of this capacity. It could be, some of it could be reverse engineered under ad transparency regimes. Like this notion that somehow targeted micro-targeted advertising is changing our behavior, I think is coming under rightful scrutiny. Um, but we'd know a lot more about it if we had very detailed targeting criteria inside an ad archive we'd actually be able to know if it did. I mean, this is stepping into kind of Peter's domain here, but like we have real limitations on this kind of behavioral research because of lack of, of, of um, fidelity or detail in the data we're provided. So like, if we wanna say that these systems are modifying behavior, which frankly, the platforms want us to believe because that's the product they're selling. Um, it may not be true though. Um, and if it's not true, the only way we're gonna find out is if we have better access into those data sets. So like, is it a problem? Maybe, how do we get at it? Well, probably auditing the algorithmic systems and better data access, I would start with mm -hmm. anyway. At least so we can understand the problem, which we, I don't think we do right now. And, and it may well be told that they don't understand the extent of their behavioral modifications either, right? Oh, I don't, this is I, the, that's the story of Burma in some ways, right? That it happened so fast the first absolutely. time. Right? Absolutely, without question. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's for sure that they don't know. Yes. I mean, because this stuff is happening so quickly at such massive scale. How can you? 100 billion pieces of content a day posted to Facebook services. Taylor, I wanna thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that the topic you're working on is, is of paramount importance uh, and e urgency even. And the second is that I don't think we could find someone who's got a sweeping view of, of, of what's going on. Um, so it's really, uh, I think we, we've all really benefited from getting a sense of, of how, uh, uh, of how this is being wrestled, this multi-headed beast is being wrestled from from various or not, various, as the days or not from various yeah. <laughs> we've got a detail from various locations. Yeah. But I hope we can have you back to SRI soon uh, and in person. Uh, and in the meantime, just uh, I'll ask everyone to join me in thanking you for for Thank joining you us. Thanks for the first. opportunity. That was really fun. Thanks so much, Taylor. Nice to talk it through. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks, guys.